Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, 12 May of 2023, we're going to start a journey with all of you. This is a journey with upside down flies. Our number one fly in our, our personal fly boxes, we're finally getting to it. We're going to talk on the weekly tip about para versus flat. You'll find out what that means as we as we move into the presentation. But we're the BDs from Boise, Idaho. And without further ado, we're going to get into, well, that one's not upside down. But we're going to tie an upside down version of it and uh, share some of the good and bad points with you and go a little further. But for tonight, let's just take a look at the, isn't that a stack of materials that, well, anyway, believe me, it's going to make a couple of flies uh, in addition to the one that we have right there. But anyway, before we get started, I've got everybody muted. If you want to uh, ask questions, do so right in the middle. No problems. Um, we're kind of the line leading the blind here. Uh, the The process with upside down flies for us has been a, a many year process. Uh, I can tell you right now, as a person who enjoys spring creek fly fishing, um, one of the flies that we introduced two weeks ago, uh, our our number one spring creek done is the bubble done, except we didn't tell you that we actually tie it upside down. And we do use some other materials. We'll get to that in subsequent evenings. But for tonight, we're just going to start with a couple of dry flies. And we're going to learn a little bit about some of the techniques you're going to need in tying something upside down. Because um, I've got I've got band aids here because I may need them. One of the things about tying upside down is that darn hook point isn't where it's been for the last sixty years. It's up in the way, but I'm not used to working with it where it is. So we'll see how that all all comes about. But what we're going to do is tie an upside down version of of a parachute. In fact, there's one right there. And uh, the the whole concept brings a bit of a of a challenge to the to the table. Let me just pull this out of here right now and uh, go to the materials, and we'll just quickly look at those materials. I've got calf tail here, the tailing material, and it's the tailing material is going to be the same on both flies. I'll set that over at the fly tying vise. My hands are in just absolutely atrocious shape from from doing some construction work uh, the last couple of weeks. So I am going to start with magic thread. And I think it was it was Jim Ferguson or Kathy Hamilton or both. I can't remember which. Do you have fingernails and can you get that thing open for me, Gretch? Thank you. And I get the thread over at the vise. We got some brown thread starting out with a brown fly, brown body material. Brown hackle. I mean, is this is really a creative? We're showing you a style of tying, not so much a particular pattern that you have to have in your fly box. I think any of you can figure out how to adjust and change how to change to. Um, oh, thank you, sweetie. How to change colors to match whatever the insects are and the sizes are in the situation that you are. Okay. But that's this magic thread. I'll hold it up in front of the in, in front of the camera here so you all can see it. This is a thanks to Kathy Hamilton and Jim Ferguson. Either or both. Anyway, this stuff is absolutely magic on. Well, my hands were cracked and been damaged uh, a couple of times through a construction project. And uh, I don't think there's any way I could have tied a fly tonight if it wasn't for this stuff. So anyway, enough, enough for the commercials. It's available on Amazon if you're interested. Now I'm going to start by placing a hook in the vise. <clears throat> I got to tell you straight out, folks, this parachute that I'm going to tie, I have been dreading doing it. I'm doing it for your, for your uh, education, if you will. And we'll talk about whether, whether I use it much or not when we get down down the line. Well, first off, the hook is in the wrong position. If I'm going to do it upside down, then the, the parachute post has to be pointing up like this. 
well okay that's that's good i guess we can do that i'll figure out how to do it but i'm going to do it this way to start out because one of the things i find about tying upside down flies is you tie part of it upside down and part of it right side up and i'm just going to start by wrapping got my thread tangled up here i'll get it untangled there we go start over that's where the uh, the wing will be placed. I'll wrap back uh, to where I will well, put my tailing on, and I'll stop right there. Remember, I I'm using a hackle fiber tail. That's the that's the hackle fiber right there from a whiting tailing pack. That's um I can't think of the name right now. It's anyway, it's a rooster from Spain. <clears throat> I want to say CDC, it's not that Cocktail Leon. That's what I'm looking for. Get that out of the way. And let's just pull some fibers out here to the side. Get them kind of lined up so that they're all even. Grab them with the left hand and tear the feather away with the right. And I'll get my tail. I like my hackle fiber tails to be about as long as a complete hook. I know that there's everywhere from one and one half times the, the length of the shank to uh, a gap more than the shank, um, the shank itself. I don't know what the correct thing is. I just happen to like uh, having the tail that is uh, about as long as a complete hook. Somewhere in all my jabber there, though, that slipped and it's too long. So I'm just going to shorten it slightly. There we go. Now, one of the things that we try to do when we're tying straight up flies is have our tail go straight out because the purpose is that, that the tip of that tail and the tips of the hackle is going to support the fly up off the water. We're going for a different profile now. And the first thing we do when we do, when we do that is we're going to wrap down slightly into the hook bend. Because I want that tail to tilt down, actually up slightly. In fact, let me get our roadmap fly. And you'll notice that this... That tail there is not straight out the back of the hook. It's in a position that best supports the complete body of that fly. So get that set out of the way. <clears throat> Trim this off. And wrap forward to my winging position. Now, I have an absolute fit of a time putting a hair wing on with that hook point there stabbing me at every time I try to make a move. So I am going to tell Al, Al, this is Jerry. Yeah. I have a suggestion. Uh, when I do upside down stuff and anything where I, you know, where you're continually poking is I use a little piece of old fly line just to tip, just cut a snip off and slide it right over the point. That's a damn good idea. I don't have any fly line here right now. So you may see a bloodbath, but I'm going <laughs> to use, I'll use Jerry's tip. Uh, after we get off tonight and I can find find some old fly line that I can cut up. That's a great idea to keep me from sacrificing myself. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to do is I, one of the things that I found is if I try to reach in here like this and control the hair and not stab myself on the hook, I've got a problem. Well, there's a thing called thread torque. And it can be your enemy, it can be your friend. And in this case, it's going to be my friend because I'm going to use thread torque to position my wing by tying it on the side of the hook and staying away from the point. But let's move over here to the materials and I'm just going to get a piece of this calf tail out here. Trim that out. You already know that I'm going to stop on the waist at the waste bin on my way back to the vice. So I'll just stop over here at the waste bin and clean out some of the fuzz that I don't want to get all over, all over the camera. Now I've got kind of a, not a great section in this calf tail, but it's, I want you to notice that it's uh, really unstacked. I mean, I've got some pretty good hair back here, 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 all the way out to here. Well, I am going to hand stack it before I try to even it up in the hair, actual hair stacker. So I'll pull these really long ones out and set them kind of in line here. And I'll pull the next bundle out and line them up. 
kind of get everything lined up a little bit before I actually stack them all in the stacker. And you'll notice now that back here at the back, I've got, got these uh, base ends all over the place. I'm just going to cut them off. Makes it easier to back them into the stacker, which is what I'm going to do right now. <clears throat> There we go. All stacked. Good. Now I want that wing to be about as long as the shank. Yeah, so I'm going to measure it for length, set it in place on the side of the hook, just kind of like you were doing a tail, uh, where you set it on the side and let thread torque. Move it up to the top of the of the hook, and that's what I'm doing here. Trim off the waist. Missed some of it. Let's get flip it over there and get that. And there we go. <clears throat> now I want to stand that wing up. And anybody that's paying attention will recognize that my wing just got short on me. I don't know. I don't know what I did. Don't worry about it. It's uh, it's only going to be an example fly. And you can see that you got to watch Al screw it up on right in, on live TV, and that's fine. But the main thing is now that I want to tighten that platform for the hackle. All right, I'm just going to keep wrapping around just like I normally do. But one of the things that I run into trouble is I keep running into that hook. So I'm going to have to do my thread wraps using a fairly short working. There we go. Another couple of turns. And remember, I like to put rebar in. So I'm going to go straight from the top of the post straight to the body and we'll make a few more turns around there and straight down to the to the shank now as you can see that this is a less than easy process working around that hook. It's a lot different than when you have that whole bare shank up here on top to work on. Now I could do it this way. Believe me, it's not any easier. Not any easier at all. <clears throat> all right, it's time to get ready to put on our, our dubbed body. Get out my dubbing wax. And I'll just put some wax on the on the thread. <clears throat> Remember, always put the lid back on. This afternoon, of all things, I didn't follow that rule. And I got to clean it up. I didn't do a very good job. I still got a bunch of fibers all over the place where it fell in the waste bin while I was practicing this afternoon, getting ready for this evening. And we can, we'll just put some some dubbing on this thread. And twist in a clockwise direction. Now I want to get my first turns of dubbing right down into that bend so it covers up that thread. And I'll just start working my way back forward. <clears throat> Need a little bit more dubbing, and we're going to be putting the feather in here too pretty quick, but we'll do that here in a minute. <clears throat> and we'll just touch dub some of the dubbing there again. Twist it into place.
And I've already got a feather selected here at size for this hat for this particular um, hook size. And uh, tie that in place right there. Now I want you to notice that I'm leaving, whoops, I just slipped on there. I'm leaving some bare stem right here. I think you can probably see that in the picture. Yeah, I'm leaving some bare stem right there because I want to have bare stem last to the post. Now I'm going to wrap back after I retwist that. Didn't do a very good job on that. Making the last turn behind the post there. Now I'm going to wrap up the post and lash my hackle to the top of the post. You see, you have to fiddle around a little bit, working your way around that hook point that's in the way. All right, now we're getting ready to wrap the hackle. Now here you're going to learn a, a new way to do a pinch wrap or a reason for doing a pinch wrap. Most people use a pinch wrap, uh, as Dutch Bachman often says in his thread control classes, to place thread. Well, we're going to use a, a pinch wrap here to place parachute hackle. I'm going to bring it around here, and I, there is nowhere to go from there except to pinch it. Move it to the other side, grab the feather on the other side, then continue wrapping. Pinch it. So we're pinch wrapping in a different way than you probably have ever seen it before. And let's see, another wrap. I think we'll make it there. Good. And I'm going to go ahead and tie that off with a turn of thread. And another turn of thread. Okay, that looks good. All right, now I'm going to tie off the um, feather and then I'll trim it away. With a half hitch. A second, and we'll put in a whip to finish it. And there we have a, a parachute version. Is it a great one? No. But I never fish parachutes in an upside down fly. Can you understand why? Because I'm a reasonably good fly tire, and I'll be danged if I can come up with a great way of, of tying those. So if any of you have a great way of tying an upside down parachute, great. But I'm going to show you something on the next fly why you may not want to use the parachute at all. But we'll we'll save that why you don't want to use it at all until later. We're going to go to the next the next fly pattern. But any questions at this point? Any comments? Hey, Al. Um, uh, Hans Klinker, when he ties to Klinkenheimer, he actually turns to fly and has the, the parachute parallel to the floor. So the, in other words, it's, it's off to the side. I wonder if that would, that would help in that. Well, um, the tail I has to go up. The tail would have to go up inside the vise is all. <clears throat> I just haven't found a way to make it real easy working around that hook. Yeah, it's and, really hard. And wrapping the hackle. But yeah. I'm going to show you something in the in the next pattern that may change your mind about hackle. If you're going to use hackle on your upside down plies, uh, it could very well change your mind on that. <clears throat> anyway, on to the next fly. Let's Let's take a look at it before we go any further. And here it is. Looks very similar.
but it's a little easier to tie, as you'll soon see. But so let me just set that down. I'll get rid of the upside down parachute. Get over at the materials. And I don't need this here anymore. I'll set that, set the uh, hackle. I just got that cold. Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go right ahead. Keeps that from flopping over on its side with that. Is it kind of unbalanced with that hookup? We're going to get to that. Oh, okay. That's part of the next several weeks. You're getting way ahead of me, Gretchen. And of course, you knew that because of many of the things that we've discussed about these flies. And But yeah, they have a tendency to flip over if not balanced properly. Yeah. And we'll get to that. Anyway, going to use some gray hackle or gray uh, dubbing, uh, some white poly yarn. And let's see. Uh, oh, and I'm going to need this. And I'm sorry, this looks like a piece of foam on a piece of cardboard uh, with a with a clothespin uh, glued to the back of it, and it is. But anyway, it's going to be something else tonight. It's going to be some flat water. All right, now we're going to go through the same process, placing the wing the same, and I'm going to wrap part of the way back to the band and stop. And we'll get our tailing material. And again, it's just a few few fibers off of that um, um, Cocktailion rooster shoulder feather. In other words, a whiting tailing pack. All right. <clears throat> Measure it for the length of the hook. Set it in place. Oh, when we talked about that thread torque and placing the wing in the previous fly, uh, this is what I was talking about. When you when you place the material on the side of the hook nearest to to allow thread torque to reposition it to the top of the hook, and that's thread torque helping you rather than hindering you. All right, we, again, we wanted the tail to tilt downhill just a little bit. And now we're going to reach over and get a get some of this some of some of this uh, poly yarn. I'm just going to cut off a piece of this. And I want you to notice that I've already taken a bodkin and run it through the yarn to take any knots out so we don't have to sit and watch me take knots out of the yarn. Poly yarn is some great stuff, but it has a few knots in it that you have to get rid of before you can actually use it. And I, I don't need a full bundle. I only need a little bit for the wing. So I'm just going to take a, oh, a small portion of that. What size is your hook? Size hook is a 12. And we'll just have a, a little bundle like that. All right, now I'm just going to take and move that into place. And we normally would leave our wing there, right? Well, we're just going to keep right on going. Because we want the wing to be on the top of the fly, which is the underside of the hook. And now I've discovered something about, because I happen to tie a heck of a lot of these, that really works well for me. Now, whether it does for you or not, I have no idea. But I have a hack of pliers here. But I seem to be able to work around that hack of pliers and the hook point a heck of a lot better than I can with that material just flopping all over the place. But I'm not trying to make a parachute post now. I am just making a wing profile, if you will, for lack of better words. And one of the things that I tried this afternoon, I've never done before, I think I'm going to like it. And that is putting just a little, little tiny drop of 
UV right here. I better get a bodkin out because that's I'm getting too big of a of a drop here. Right? There we go. We want very just a very very little. Now that'll just kind of pull that all together. And I can take the hackle pliers off, but I find that working around those hackle pliers is helpful for me at this stage. And uh, getting ready to put on the dubbing. Touch dub it on in place. Now, you may find working around that hackle plier is a real pain in the neck for you, and that's fine. If you do, get rid of it. And I will right now. But I'm liking what that little, little tiny drop of UV did for me. It just kind of stabilized it and kept it all together, I guess you could say, rather than allowing it to just go puff all over the place like it usually does. <clears throat> yeah, that, that looks pretty good. All right, wrap our hackle. One of the things about upside down tying, you end up looking at the underside quite a bit. I don't know why it seems, I guess you could do that on all flies, but anyway, that's what I've found. I'll flip it back to the regular orientation to do our dog legging the hackle like we usually do and to build us a nice thread head. Get our whip finish tool. Trim the thread, trim the hackle, and trim the wing. And I think just for fun's sake, I'll uh, trim that trim that wing at an angle. Doesn't make any difference, but and there it is. Except, well, that's not going to sit on the on the water that good upside down because what I really want to do with this is do a water walker type separation of the hackle. See what I'm doing here? In fact, let me hold the, now there is the roadmap fly, and that's the footprint I'm looking for on that upside down fly. Well, so what I'm, what I'm doing here, it's a little bit hard to see. I don't know if I can turn that to where you can, there you can, you can see that pretty well. So kind of on its side, but I'm getting the underside pulled out to the sides. making sure all the hackles are laying straight, but I want them pulled down to the side so that when they start to return to normal, you'll notice they're downward slightly, giving us a footprint on the water. That is exactly what I'm looking for. Well, the only way I'm going to keep that the way I want it want is to take a heated needle or my handy-dandy hair dryer, which I'm going to grab right now. Yep, there it is. Handy dandy Gretchen's. It used to be Gretchen's hair dryer. I don't need one, by the way. And we'll turn that guy on.
All right, and let's see what we've got here. Put a little head cement on there too, couldn't you? Could put head cement on there, absolutely. And now I want what I want to do to share with you is the the hackle and the way it's going to set on the water. In fact, let's talk about setting on the water. I'm going to set this fly down. I'll get that other uh, parachute fly. And we'll set them on our piece of cardboard that's going to imitate water for us. And we'll see what, what that looks like. Okay. Parachute. And standard wrap. Well, that looks pretty good. Well, let's turn them towards the camera so we can see what they look like as they come down the river. Uh, move this guy over so he can be seen a little bit better. Yeah, they both look pretty good, but I can tell you right now from past experience, I want you to notice that the body on the left, the parachute, there's dimension to that body and it has to sink completely into the surface film for the outriggers, the hackle, to support it, to keep it from tipping over. And it will tip one way, other way, other way, where this one doesn't tip. It sets on its outriggers and tail, just like you see there. Could you drop them in the tank? I could. In fact, let me set that up, Gretchen. Now, I don't know if I can zoom in on that or not. We're going to find out. I like the way they both the way they both go. Now I'm going to explain to you something that Gretchen alluded to a minute ago in balance and tipping over and all that stuff. Let me get these out of the tank for right now. Okay, here's the problem with the calf tail parachute. First off, you already know that there's a chance for it to tip over. Let me see if I can get that to set better. It'll tip over because the support, see if I can get that up there, there you go. The support is um, um, a sixteenth of an inch or so above the part that it should be supporting. So the hook can tip one way or the other. Now here's the real kicker, and that's why I never, never fish parachutes with a, with a, a hair wing. This doesn't collapse well. It's uh, too stiff, and guess what? You can't hook the fish. Can't hook the fish worth a darn. On the other hand, let me get this other fly. I'll set that down. Now here's the other guy. Better profile on the water. And I'll just touch it with my scissors. That collapses like crazy and comes back, doesn't get tangled up because it's poly yarn or it's C I use a lot of CDC as well instead of poly yarn, but it will, it will collapse and allow the fish to be hooked very easily. You know, you've heard of catch and release. This is release ahead of time. Catch, release, <laughs> catch, release, huh? And in fact, that process was patented by a fellow by the name of Jim Green in the late 90s, early 2000s. And a, he produced those flies for, oh, I'll say five years. I, I, I can't remember, but he's since passed and it's no longer on the market. But they were called water wisp. And you may remember he even had a special hook designed for him. And, and in fact, back in 
05 or somewhere in the early 2000s, Gretchen and I did a magazine article for Fly Fish America on his flies and all that stuff. And Jim and I had been pretty friendly at the shows over the years. And so I called him and he sent me some of his uh, hooks, special hooks, because you don't just use any hook. It's a, it looks like a standard dry fly hook, a little bit short shank, but the the ring eye is on an up and down basis, not across, not across this way, it's up and down this way. And um, that was, was something different. Anyway, that'll be one of the things that we're going to cover in future episodes of this upside down journey that we're going through. Balancing. We talked a little bit about it just a few minutes ago, about the balancing of tipping in your outriggers. You've got two things that you have to deal with when you're fishing an upside down dry. You've got the parachute effect. The parachute is a effect and it's what allows it to settle on the water. Once it hits the water, if it doesn't have outriggers in some form or another, it's gonna fall over. It's, um, I've, I've watched it happen many, many times. Even a puff of CDC will do a pretty good job of providing uh, outriggers, if you will, because it kind of puffs up and fans out like that across the, the hook and will 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 land and support it after it lands. But you must have some type, you must have a parachute effect followed by a platform. Um, I don't know, I can't think of any any better anything else. I used to run a backhoe and you put your you put your uh, legs out to support to stabilize the backhoe so it doesn't tip side to side. And that's Basically, basically your stabilizers on the fly. Now, when we get into the underwater version of the upside down fly, there's quite a there's quite a lot goes into that. More so, first off, you can flip the fly the the hook over with just materials without any weight, and that works really good until you hit current that affects your leader or hits the fly from the side and so forth, and it'll flip over on you. If you want it to always travel uh, with the hook point up, there's some things that you need to do to it. And we've, we've got that pretty well, pretty well worked out. And we'll go over that as we go into future events. And that's it. Okay, and the weekly tip. You've already seen a comparison between a parachute hackle and a flat wrap tackle. Uh, when I say flat wrap, I mean it's wrapped and then it's flattened on one side for a hackle application on our upside down flies. But the ring, what are we talking about? The ring on the weekly tip. Well, I'm going to, I've been thinking about the Henry Fork a lot lately. That's because the railroad ranch is going to open here in a few weeks. And I kind of get this awful itchy feeling in, in between my shoulder blades. When, when that time comes close because it's green great time and it's railroad ranch time and it's two very fun things at least as far as I'm concerned. So I'll talk in reference to the Henry's Fork. Now, I don't know if any of you who fish Spring Creeks to any amount have noticed but this happens to a more or lesser degree on all Spring Creeks and Spring Creek type waters. And when I say a Spring, spring Creek type water, the Henry's Fork is really a tail, kind of a tailwater fishery out of a, out of a, a, a lake up in, by, um, anyway, a lake uh, up in the headwaters there of the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. But it's just a nice flowing Spring Creek type of uh, environment. One of the things that I noticed there is you'll see a flat stretch of water. You look out at that water and all of a sudden a bubble, I mean a bubble as big as my fist, will come to the surface, pop, and then spread into a circle as it goes down river. And that cake keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes down river. And I noticed this phenomenon probably 20 years ago. Eh, no, longer than that, 30 years ago, back in the 80s. And I would and I would watch that thing and I, what causes that? I never could figure out what caused it. I still don't know what causes it. But something in that flat water causes that, that bubble to happen. But what I did learn is I could stand there false casting, waiting for a bubble. Bu bubble right over there, 20 feet. 
pow, and I punched my fly. And when I could land that fly in the circle, when it was about this big around, it would continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger as it dissipated and went downstream. But for about 15 foot, I could get an absolutely perfect drift because the edge of that circle just grabbed my leader and kept my fly in position and moved it all downstream. I can't tell you how many fish I've caught in the Spring Creek environment with the ring in the bubble. Now, what you guys do with that bit of information, this just could be some old guy that has dreamed up something. Which, oh, Alan Curie's question, which situation fish better with these upside down flies? I don't think it makes any difference whether they're upside down or right side up, Alan. When you're fishing the more broken water, like the Yellowstone River, uh, some of the Freestone Rivers of the East, um, it's it, the water's broken enough, it doesn't really make any difference if there's a hook sticking down through the surface film. But I'll guarantee you on spring creeks, just like we talked a couple of weeks ago on the bubble done, what I left out of that presentation is the fact that all my bubble duns have their hook point pointing up. And it makes, uh, on a spring creek, when the fish have a chance to come up and say, hey, George, you see that down there? That's got two turns of thread in the wrong place. I don't look right, and they'll sink back to the bottom. Well, when you run into that kind of fishing, the hook point up makes a difference rather than the hook point in the water. But we'll be talking about that more over the next weeks. But thanks for the question, Alan. And that's it for now, folks. Thank you for joining us. That's a wrap until next time.